USTC Taney compiled an impressive record during and after Pearl Harbor. Constructed in the middle of the 1930s as a popular example of the treasury class of major U.S. cutting vessels of the United States Coast Guard, the USC Chi Taney had a storied career that spanned 50 years of continuous duty, a substantial combat record during World War II, which placed the ship in danger from the beginning of the Pacific War in 1941 until Japan's surrender in 1945 as well as periods of convoy escort duty in the Atlantic along the way, is one of the notable aspects of Taney's historic background. Visitors to the historic vessel, which is now maintained as a museum in Baltimore, Maryland, have the opportunity to develop a profound understanding for the acts and sacrifices of Coast Guardsmen during World War II while exploring one of the ships that they took into battle. At the time of their commissioning, the seven cutters of the Treasury class were the largest and most capable ships in the United States Navy. Taney and her sister ships continued to serve in the Coast Guard until the 1960s, a distinction that they had maintained until then. All three of them were constructed in the midst of the Great Depression in the United States. During their extensive active lives, Navy shipyards and their employees profited from exceptional craftsmanship, which partially accounted for their longevity. They had a length of 327 feet, a beam of 41 feet, and a displacement of 2,000 tons when they were first constructed. They were steam turbine-driven, single-rudder, twin-screw vessels with sturdy hulls fashioned from riveted steel plates that were half an inch thick. Treasury-class cutters had a maximum speed of 20 knots, and their initial armament consisted of two 5-inch deck cannons and two 3-pounder saluting guns. These cutters were designed for peacetime roles of law enforcement, search and rescue, and maritime patrol. As would be demonstrated on numerous occasions, particularly during World War II, the 327s have an unrivaled capacity to adapt to shifting responsibilities and difficult circumstances as a result of the remarkable plasticity of its fundamental design. On May 1, 1935, the Philadelphia Navy Yard was the location where the keel of Taney was put down. Built with three of her sister ships, Campbell, Duane, and Ingham, the new cutter was given the name Roger B. Taney on June 3, 1936. The name was reduced to simply Taney in 1940, in honor of the Chief Justice of the United States of America. The Supreme Court during the period of the well-known Dred Scott decision, which occurred during the Civil War. Immediately following its commissioning in October of that year, the vessel made its way through the Panama Canal and arrived at her initial duty station in Honolulu, Hawaii, in January of the following year. Over the course of her operational career, Taney would spend the most of her time in the Pacific Ocean, earning her the nickname the Queen of the Pacific. Over the course of the years leading up to the commencement of World War II, the cutter was responsible for search and rescue operations the pursuit of opium traffickers off the coast of Hawaii, and the protection of American interests in the Line Islands, which are located just below the equator. By the year 1940, the United States was getting ready for war. As a result of the Navy's interest in the Treasury-class cutters, Taney and her sister ships were given significant weapon modifications, which enabled them to possess anti-aircraft and anti-submarine capabilities. During the course of two separate refits that took place in 1940 and 1941, Taney was equipped with a battery of anti-aircraft weapons with a caliber off 50, additional machine gun mounts with a caliber off 50, sonar equipment, stern depth charge racks, and depth charge throwing eye guns. Despite the fact that they had their Coast Guard crews, the 327s were moved from the Treasury Department to the Navy in July of 1941 in preparation for the possibility of war between the two countries. The United States Navy joined Taney's sister ships, Navy forces in North Atlantic patrols, the Queen of the Pacific, which is now resplendent in a coat of Navy gray paint and is formally designated as the U.S. Taney CG commenced operations out of Honolulu as a unit of Destroyer Division 80, Inshore Patrol Forces, Inshore Patrol Force. It would be the Cutter's principal responsibility to conduct anti-submarine patrols off the coast of Pearl Harbor in the event that war broke out. In the early hours of December 7, 1941, 
Taney was found tethered at her home berth on Pier 6, which was located close to the Aloha Tower in Honolulu. Shortly before 7 o'clock in the morning, operators on duty in the radio room of the cutter copied an unexpected message from another unit of Destroyer Division 80. The message was from the U.S. Ward, which reported that it had attacked and sunk an enemy submarine in the approaches to Pearl Harbor. This was the first indication of what was to come. The officer of the deck, LOD, who was on duty that morning promptly recalled all officers from shore and instructed the crew to style the ship's deck awnings, remove gun covers, and fetch ammunition from the magazine. This was done shortly after the LOD received the message, which indicated that a dramatic change of events had occurred. Following the completion of the preparatory work, the Coast Guardsmen waited to observe what, if anything, would take place in the subsequent events. The sky to the northwest suddenly became filled with anti-aircraft bursts at approximately 8 in the morning. This occurred when Navy ships began a furious defense of Pearl Harbor, which was approximately 8 miles away. Taney Skipper, Commander Louis B. Olson of the United States Coast Guard, issued the order to sound general quarters and then called for steam in order to make the ship ready to head out on the water. Olson subsequently stated that the ship's anti-aircraft battery, as well as all other guns were ready to fire with their entire crew and three officers at their posts within four minutes. This was despite the fact that some of the ship's officers had not yet made it back aboard the vessel. As the conflict raged, the sky above the fleet anchorage grew black from the smoke of burning ships. The crew of Taney waited for an opportunity to start fire in the event that enemy planes approached Honolulu. The order to begin shooting was given by Olsen one hour after he had gone to battle stations at nine minutes past the hour and again at 9.15 minutes after that. Several scattered formations of Japanese planes appeared above. The ship's two anti-aircraft cannons measuring three inches each went into action on the fantail of the Taney firing around 27 rounds of shrapnel ammunition at the raiders, whose distance and height were just at the point where they were not within effective range. Despite the fact that they were manned, the remaining guns on the ship stood in silent frustration. The front three-inch gun would not bear, and the five-inch main armament was ineffective against aircraft. In his journal, which he kept shortly after the attack, Taney radioman Morris Thorson documented the degree of uncertainty that prevailed during the early morning hours of December 7. We were under the impression that it was a rehearsal because we conduct them on a regular basis. Yet, we heard gunfire with the direction of Pearl Harbor. Even yet, this did not provide us with any insight into what was taking place, as the units frequently engage in the practice of firing at sleeves that are being towed by planes. We did not begin shooting on Japanese aircraft until it was later determined that some of the planes that were approaching Honolulu were Japanese. On the other hand, we were clueless about the situation. Despite the fact that everyone in the crew shared their ideas, they were still unable to accept the fact that we were being attacked. Sirens were blaring, and we could see army trucks speeding back and forth. During the morning, there was a great deal of uncertainty as Japanese planes not only targeted Battleship Row and the facilities that were near to it, but they also hit installations belonging to the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps all around the island of Oahu. Small groups of Japanese aircraft continued to come until practically noon, despite the fact that the majority of Japanese aircraft had finished their strikes by 10 o'clock in the morning. Between the hours of 11 and 11.35, a number of American ships opened fire on Japanese bombers that were stationed at Pearl Harbor. For the duration of the morning, Taney's crew remained at their battle positions in Honolulu in preparation for the possibility that the raiders would return to the city. In addition to the rising smoke that could be seen over the fleet anchoring in the distance, the city of Honolulu took on an ominous air as the odor of burning buildings and the sounds of explosions hovered over the metropolis. At Pearl Harbor, a large number of anti-aircraft bullets fired from Navy ships burst into flames after failing to hit their intended targets. In the vicinity of Honolulu, at 11.35, a small formation of Japanese aircraft came overhead. The crew of Taney's forward three-inch gun was able to sight in and open fire for a brief period of time, but their efforts were ultimately fruitless. 
it was now possible for the gun crews of the cutter to engage a target at close range, and this occurred just before midday. At 11.58, reported Commander Olson, a formation of five enemy planes approached the vessel directly from the south-southwest over the harbor entrance on what appeared to be a glide bombing or strafing attack on this vessel or more probably, the power plant, which is located north of the vessel's berth at Pier 6. Every gun that would bear opened up on the planes, which were rocked by the fire and swerved up and away. Olson was also able to report, Several 50 caliber tracers appeared to pierce the wing and tail structure of one plane before the attackers changed course to avoid the barrage. It was observed that there was no further Japanese air activity over Honolulu, and by the afternoon, Taney's gunmen were given permission to relax at their positions. The officers and crew bore themselves well, Olson said in the aftermath of the attack, despite the fact that the majority of the crew members had no training other than practice and had never seen anything above a 50 caliber shot, Olson said. In the early morning hours of December 8, 1941, the United States Coast Guard vessel Taney was en route to her pre-assigned anti-submarine patrol area between Honolulu and the entrance to Pearl Harbor. This occurred at a time when American forces in Hawaii were still trying to recover from the shock of the Japanese attack. Between the dates of December 8 and 14, the cutter carried out seven depth charge strikes on submarines that were believed to be Japanese, with the most famous attack occurring on December 10. On that particular evening, as Taney was on patrol with the U.S. Ramsey, DN-16, he picked up a powerful sonar echo and then dropped a pattern of depth charges on a location approximately three miles off the coast of Honolulu. After a short period of time, a big oil slick emerged over the location, and it remained there for two days. This led to speculation that a submarine may have been hit there in the first place. In the weeks that followed the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Coast Guard crew that Taney was assigned to had to make certain adjustments in order to accommodate the sudden switch to combat operations. The first few days were difficult for all of the crew due to all of the battle station alerts and the dropping of depth charges. Crewman Morris Thorson wrote in his diary, the dumping of depth charges was a particularly severe event. We started to train ourselves so that when the depth charges were dropped, we would be able to determine that it was not a bomb or a torpedo that was hitting us. The depth charges detonate with such a tremendous explosion that the entire ship would shake and tremble throughout the explosive event. In the event that we are sufficiently close to the destroyers when they release their depth charges, the ship will likewise react in the same manner. Taney's patrol operations off the coast of Oahu soon became normal for the ship and crew, and they were performed in addition to special deployments and tasks involving convoy escorts. Robert Gender, a Taney crewman who reported aboard as a seaman in early 1943, later recalled that the cutter was frequently killing time in between assignments by being on what was called the Easy Circle. This was an anti-submarine patrol between Barber's Point and Diamond Head, and it covered both the entrance to Pearl Harbor and the entrance to Honolulu Harbor. Gunder was a member of the Taney crew. We would travel back and forth for a total of 12 days, after which we would spend two days in port, and then return for another 12 days, but this time on various jobs. We were transporting supplies to a region known as the Hawaiian Sea Frontier, which extended from Midway Island, which was located to the northwest, to Johnson Island, which was located south of Midway Island, to Canton Island, which was located south of Johnson Island, to Palmyra Island, which was located northeast of Palmyra Island, and finally back to Honolulu. Consequently, the ship would be responsible for escorting supply ships and tankers to those outlying locations in order to ensure that they were provided with food and gasoline. This expedition would take around three weeks each time it was undertaken. During a special mission to the Line Islands, which took place in July 1943 some 1,600 miles southwest of Hawaii, a Japanese patrol bomber came dangerously close to putting a stop to Taney's active and successful career. According to Gunther, Taney was on its way back from Palmyra Island when the ship received orders to take a surveying crew from the Seabees to a place called Baker Island to see if it was feasible to put an airbase. 
there to help with the invasion of Tarawa. And while we were getting ready to offload our CBs on the island, we were discovered by a Japanese patrol plane. Baker Island was located in the vicinity of the island. According to Homer Compton, who served as a boatswain's mate in Taney's deck force, the ship came dangerously near to being hit by Japanese bombs many years later. It was almost two hours before nightfall when we got at Baker. Without knowing whether or not the island was inhabited by the Japanese, the crew of the five-inch cannon that was located aft was supposed to make up the landing party. It was decided to publish grenades and rifles. The landing boat would be towed to the surf by the power launch, which would then wait for the return of the landing boat. We were soon discovered by a Japanese bomber known as a Mazda. It goes without saying that the landing was delayed at this point in time. During the time that our three-inch guns were putting up a significant quantity of fire, the Mavis was preparing for an aft-to-forward run. Taney employed speed and evasive maneuvers to present a challenging target to the enemy bomber as it began a shallow drop. This caused the Japanese pilot to initially break off his attack while Taney was successful in his mission. According to Compton's recollection, they circled for another run because they were unable to get us in their bomb sites. We prepared our weapons, and before long, they were blazing away toward us. Subsequently, the vapor blows out and streams away. We were aware that it was only a matter of seconds because we were going full steam ahead and left full rudder. Everyone that wasn't on a gun hit the deck. Though two explosions rocked the ship from near misses, the violent maneuvering paid off and the Japanese bomber eventually retreated, as did the cutter in case additional planes should appear. After a period of two weeks, Taney went back to Baker Island to finish the task. This time, he was joined by air support. During World War II, the majority of the men who served on Taney's crew were volunteers who had joined the Coast Guard in search of a similar experience to that of the Navy, but one that was significantly more unique and intimate. There were only 16,000 draftees serving in the Coast Guard when it reached its greatest strength during the war, which was little more than 214,000. Coast Guardsmen who were assigned to larger ships were frequently on board for extended tours of duty, and they frequently grew to look with an uncommon amount of pride on their particular ship, was determined by their rate or their specifically trained specialization. According to Gunther, there was a huge deal of pride because in the Navy, basically, you had an 18-month tour of duty and then you were transferred off. However, a significant number of us who were stationed on the Taney remained there for a period of time that may reach up to three years. This was due to the fact that there was no other place for a Red Armin to go other than on a major Coast Guard ship. It would appear that you have gotten really near to your ship. Following nearly two years of service during the war, the Queen of the Pacific, made its way back to California in order to undergo yet another significant update to its arsenal. As a result of the modifications that were carried out at the Alameda, California Navy Yard, and later at the Mare Island Navy Yard, Taney was able to get rid of her relatively antiquated 5-inch and 3-inch cannons and replace them with four enclosed mount 5-inch dual-purpose guns that are capable of firing against both surface targets and aircraft. Eight 20 mm rapid-fire cannons were deployed throughout the bridge and superstructure in order to provide close-in anti-aircraft capability. However, later in 1944, two of these cannons would be replaced by twin 40 mm mounts that were more powerful and could provide more lethal firepower. The ship's anti-submarine capability was improved with the addition of a forward-firing hedgehog anti-submarine weapon and the depth charge racks and throwers were not altered in any way. As opposed to depth charges, hedgehogs were launched in front of the ship at the estimated location of an enemy submarine. They were designed to explode upon impact with the hostile submarine. At long last, Taney was equipped with improved surface and air search radars, which enabled the cutter to acquire more sophisticated detecting capabilities. Once Taney had completed his work at Mare Island, he was awaiting orders for the Atlantic. Following his passage through the Panama Canal, the cutter arrived to the Boston Navy Yard in order to undergo an additional upgrade of the ship's Combat Information Center, CIC. Following the completion of this task, 
The crew had the opportunity to participate in gunnery training at Casco Bay, Maine, prior to being assigned to its first Atlantic combat mission. The sister ships of Taney had proven themselves to be first-class escort vessels, and they had taken the brunt of the convoy fights against German U-boats over the course of the preceding two years. They possessed superb sea-keeping abilities, speed, and firepower. During the year 1944, Taney's role would be to command a group of anti-submarine vessels that were attached to convoys that were moving between the east coast of the United States and North Africa. Gender who had returned to Taney in 1944 after completing his training as a radarman, said that the majority of them were people who escorted destroyers. A few of them were staffed by the Coast Guard, and a few of them were United States. On those large convoys, there were a total of 13 escorts, and the Taney was in charge of them. Some of the escorts were from other countries, while others were from the United States Marine Corps. Throughout her time in the Atlantic convoy, Taney was the flagship for Task Force 66, which was the United States Navy. United States Navy Captain W.H. Duval commanded the Atlantic Fleet at the beginning of the first of six Atlantic convoy runs, which took place on April 2, 1944. 85 ships belonging to convoy UGS-38 gathered off Hampton Roads, Virginia, with the intention of traveling to Libya. It was possible for Duval to efficiently maintain track of the merchant ships that were part of the convoy and coordinate the escorts by utilizing Taney's communications equipment as well as sophisticated surface and air search radars. The convoy steadily made its way across the Atlantic Ocean, with Taney cruising 4,000 yards ahead of it conducting radar and sonar sweeps. The convoy was constantly on the lookout for German U-boats and aircraft that could strike the merchant ships at any moment. As of the 20th of April, the convoy had traversed the Strait of Gibraltar and was currently located off the African coast of Tunisia, who evening, at approximately 9 o'clock in the evening, a group of German Junkers, Ju-88 and Heinkel He-111 bombers unexpectedly materialized out of the shadows and began torpedo strikes on the crowded cargo ships and the escorts who were accompanying them. Even though enemy reconnaissance planes had been detected earlier in the day and several suspicious radar contacts had created anxiety, the torpedo strike came without warning because the bombers arrived at low level using the African coastline to conceal their movements from radar. This allowed the bombers to avoid detection by radar. Taney's crew started rushing to their combat stations as soon as they heard the general alarm, which occurred at the same time as they were able to visually identify the German attackers. After a few minutes, the sky suddenly burst in dazzling light as a result of the explosion of the merchant ship SS Paul Hamilton which was loaded with troops and ammunition. The explosion was caused by a German torpedo hit. The ship imploded with a thunderous scream, taking roughly 550 men with it, and all eyes on board Taney turned toward the scene as it occurred. In response to the raiders, Taney's 20mm and 40mm anti-aircraft guns opened fire on them. The raiders continued to launch low-level strikes while moving up and down the rows of ships. Despite the fact that the crews of the five-inch guns established their positions, they were not allowed to fire at the Germans who were flying at a low altitude because they were afraid of hitting the other ships in the convoy. The destroyer U.S. at Lansdale, DD-426, which had been hit by two aerial torpedoes, was shattered into two halves shortly after the explosion of the SS Paul Hamilton, resulting in the loss of 47 members of her crew. When successive rounds of attacks were launched, Taney narrowly avoided being hit by two torpedoes, while two other merchantmen were struck. Tracer ammunition was fired in all directions by anti-aircraft gunners throughout the convoy, which made the possibility of casualties caused by friendly fire significantly more likely than it had been previously. In the course of the 17-minute combat, three Coast Guardsmen on Taney were struck by shrapnel from the fire of other ships, while they were engaged in the act of firing at the pirates. According to estimates, there were around six enemy aircraft that were shot down during the raid. After the last of the enemy aircraft had departed, the damage was evaluated, and survivors were rescued from the water. Among the survivors were numerous German airmen. Not only had the destroyer Lansdale and the SS Paul Hamilton been completely destroyed, 
but three merchant ships had also suffered severe damage along with them. On May 1, 1944, Taney traveled to Bizert, Tunisia, in order to pick up the convoy GUS-38, which was headed toward the United States of America. This occurred after the elements of convoy UGS-38 had dispersed to their respective destinations, in spite of the fact that U-boat activity occurred along the route, which resulted in the loss of several escort vessels. The 107 merchantmen comprised the convoy were successfully delivered to American ports around two weeks later. The United States Coast Guard vessel U.S. Menges, D-320, was struck by an acoustic homing torpedo fired from a submarine on May 3. The incident occurred when the vessel was conducting an investigation into a radar contact several miles behind the convoy. Although the ship was finally saved, 26 members of the Coast Guard were murdered in the incident. In the following two days, the destroyer U.S. Fechtel was torpedoed and sunk, resulting in the loss of 29 crew members. This occurred while the convoy GUS-38 was approaching Gibraltar. During the year 1944, Taney continued to serve as the flagship for Task Force 66 on four other convoys between the United States and the Mediterranean. However, none of these convoys brought as much excitement as the initial one did. Following her departure from flagship duty on October 8, 1944, the cutter made its way to the Boston Navy, yard for what would prove to be her final and most significant refurbishment during the war. When the ship emerged from Boston three months later, her appearance was almost completely different from what it had been when she had entered. Gone were the sleek lines of a first-class escort vessel, and in their stead was the unattractive and boxy form of an amphibious command ship, AGC. Taney's upgrades included living and working rooms for an admiral and staff, as well as extensive communication facilities. AGCs were supposed to operate as headquarters platforms for amphibious operations, and Taney's adaptations included these features. Behind the Cutter's Bridge, a massive superstructure portion was erected, and it was there that the newly created command spaces were located. The enclosed gun positions and hedgehogs, measuring five inches in diameter, were also removed. But in their place was a sizable anti-aircraft armament that consisted of three 40mm guns that were twins and a plethora of 20mm weapons that were spread out around the ship. In order to reduce the amount of weight, the splinter shield enclosures were removed from the main deck, although two five-inchers were kept on the main deck ahead and aft. Following the completion of sea trials in Boston, Taney proceeded to the south to finish her gunnery training with her newly acquired weaponry near Hampton Roads. After that, she steamed for the Pacific Ocean through the Panama Canal. When the cutter arrived at Pearl Harbor on February 22, 1945, it was immediately designated as the flagship for Navy Rear Admiral Calvin H. Cobb, United States Navy. Once the admiral staff joined the ship, Taney's complement reached its peak of 250 officers and men, which was nearly twice the number of people the ship was initially designed to accommodate. Once again departing from Hawaii on March 10, 1945, Taney made his way into the Western Pacific, where the invasion of Okinawa, the final major battle of the war, was about to take place. Cobb's role in the upcoming campaign would put the United States Coast Guard ship Taney in a more precarious position than it has ever been before. He is the commander of Task Group 99.1 and is also a potential commander of naval troops in the Ryukyu Islands. Japan would launch almost 1,900 kamikaze planes against the United States fleet during the Okinawa War. As a result of this battle, 36 ships would be sunk and another 368 ships would be damaged, making it the most expensive campaign in United States history. The History of Sales Taney pulled anchor on April 7, 1945, after having spent the previous week waiting for instructions at Ulithian. Within four days, she made her way to the Higashi Landing Beaches, which are located on the west coast of Okinawa. On April 1, 1945, Marine and Army forces landed on the beaches. The crew of the Taney was summoned to general quarters three times on their very first day off Okinawa, as Japanese planes attacked the Anchorage. This event laid the groundwork for the subsequent weeks that were to follow. When the general quarters alarm went off once more the following morning at 5.43 a.m., 
it was because a twin-engine Betty bomber was flying low over the Anchorage. The Japanese raider crossed the bow of the Taney at a distance of only 1,200 yards, and the forward 20 millimeters gun crews of the ship opened fire, repeatedly hitting the plane that fell into the water close. During the first month of the campaign, Taney stayed anchored among the transports at Higashi, with the exception of frequent refueling at Karama Rato, which is located off the southwest coast of Okinawa. The Japanese carry out kamikaze attacks and air raids on a daily basis, and in addition to putting up a significant amount of anti-aircraft fire, Taney and the other ships that were anchored relied on massive smoke screens for protection. The Taney weighed anchor on May 11, 1945, after having waited for additional orders off of Higashi for a period of 27 days. It then went to the southern anchorage off of the island of Aishima, which is located three and a half miles west of Okinawa. In that location, Rear Cobb took over for Rear Admiral L.F. Reefsnyder as commander of Task. Group 51.21 and senior officer present afloat, SOPA. In this capacity, Rear Cobb was responsible for commanding all local naval activities that took place off the coast of northern Okinawa. Aishima's southern anchorage turned out to be a significantly more vulnerable site than Taney's previous position near Higashi, and in the weeks that were to follow, the intensity of Japanese aviation activity would reach its highest point. The Japanese conducted annoying attacks every night during the first several days while the cutter was stationed at Aishima. These raids forced the crew to attend combat stations, where they remained for extended periods of time. The level of air activity increased. On May 18, and in addition to multiple alarms that were sent early in the morning, Japanese aircraft returned that evening to target cargo ships that were located off the coast of Aishima. Shortly after going to general quarters at 7.30 in the morning, Taney's gun crews opened fire on a Japanese Kate torpedo bomber that had been converted into a kamikaze, causing it to crash into the water nearby. This was the first of four kamikazes that were officially ascribed to the cutter's guns. A total of five additional enemy raids were carried out on the Anchorage over the course of the subsequent four hours. Additionally, the Coast Guardsmen aboard Taney saw the destruction of the neighboring LST-808 by torpedo planes. Another round of kamikaze attacks was launched against Aishima on the evening of May 20, 1945, following a comparatively calm day on May 19. While the attack was taking place, the gun crews of the Taney added to the ship's score when a pair of kamikazes attempted suicide runs on transports that were in the vicinity. The first plane approached the ship from an estimated altitude of 1,000 feet when put under fire by main and secondary batteries, according to Taney's war journal. After that, the plane turned away in a tight circle and continued its flight. One kamikaze was unexpectedly rocked by a 5-inch burst and struck repeatedly by 40 millimeters and 20 millimeters fire, which caused it to fall into the water near to a Dutch freighter. This occurred after the kamikaze had reached a level of stability. After Taney's anti-aircraft weapons had splashed the first plane, they quickly changed their focus to a second kamikaze, which was observed to be focusing on the cutter from an altitude of only 800 feet, immediately in front of the aircraft. A well-placed 5-inch round detonated, and the plane seemed to halt abruptly and then went into a steep dive causing it to smash into the hulk of the LST-808 that had been abandoned two days earlier. Over the course of the subsequent days, Japanese raids persisted, and given the amount of strain that was being exerted, it is not surprising that at least one incident of friendly fire occurred. A wayward Navy F-6F Hellcat approached the Anchorage at Aishima from the same direction as numerous recent air attacks on the morning of May 21. This was an unsafe approach. As the fighter plane strangely sailed at the ship at a low level, Taney's gun crews held fire until the very last minute because they were unable to identify the plane because it was flying directly toward them. After Taney's and the other ships in the vicinity opened fire, the aircraft turned away, exposing the markings of the United States aircraft. Although there was a sudden cessation of fire, the fighter had been struck and crashed in the vicinity. 
it is not possible to stave the pilot. Taney stayed almost continuously at general quarters for three and a half days beginning on the evening of May 24, 1945, during what became the most battle-heavy period in the ship's history. This occurred during the last week of May 1945, when Japanese air activity reached its most ferocious climax over Aishima. Raiders from mainland Japan arrived over Aishima at sunset on May 24 and began destroying the airfield as well as the shore fortifications within the island. Due to the fact that there were 34 distinct waves of planes that flew over the Anchorage to bomb and strafe, the night was very long. Last but not least, Taney secured the general quarters at 4.40 in the morning on May 25 so that those who were not on watch might get some rest. The period of rest that Taney enjoyed that morning was brief, and at 7.55 in the morning, a ferocious series of assaults started. As soon as the alarm was activated, Taney's gun crews opened fire on a kamikaze, the pilot of which had commenced a suicide dive toward the adjacent merchant ship SS Brown Victory. This process took place within five minutes. During the hail of fire from the cutter, which included a 5-inch, 40-millimeter, and 20-millimeter rounds, the aircraft was struck many times and veered out of control, narrowly missing its intended target as it crashed into the water. As other kamikazes reached their destination, there was little time for cheering. At 8.4 in the morning, Taney opened fire on another kamikaze that had passed overhead. It then crashed right into the minesweeper U.S. spectacle, M305, which was located nearby. This caused a big hole to be torn in the side of the little ship, and it knocked many of the crewmen who had been operating her weapons into the water. A short while later, another suicide jet crashed into the landing ship LSM-135, which had begun collecting survivors from the mine sweeper that had been damaged, transforming it into a flaming hulk. During a brief gap in the onslaught, all of the soldiers stayed at their combat stations, waiting anxiously for the next sequence of events to take place. Approximately 10 minutes after 11 o'clock in the morning, the Anchorage suddenly became active with anti-aircraft fire. At 11.20, the crew of the Taney noticed a massive explosion in the distance, which occurred as the tiny troop transport U.S. Bates, APD-47, was destroyed by yet another suicide plane from Japan. Shortly after Bates was struck, the attacks began to abate. Nonetheless, Taney's crew continued to remain at their positions, anxiously scouring the sky for any remaining targets. Even those who were the steadiest among them were thrown off by the intensity of the strikes, and they could only wonder at the reckless determination of the pilots who were working against them. Since the beginning of the war, the Taney had been a remarkably fortunate ship, particularly considering that a number of smaller vessels had already been singled out by kamikazes. Off the coast of Aishima, the American ships had endured a difficult and expensive ordeal on the morning of May 25. Unfortunately, Japanese raiders did not return until the afternoon of May 26. Fortunately, Navy planes that were participating in the combat air patrol were able to discourage them from returning. During the brief period of respite from the kamikaze strikes, Signalman Ontani received a message from the SS Brown Victory that was transmitted using flashing light. The message made reference to the cutter's successful shooting from the previous day and stated, Thanks very much for saving our fannies. Following the continuation of air attacks on the morning of May 27, a group of 10 Aichi Vol dive bombers conducted a raid on the Anchorage. However, they were driven away by U.S. fighters that were patrolling the area. After the sun went down, sustained bombing raids began once more. Taney's crew remained at their combat stations throughout the night, and they did not secure their positions until around 5.30 the following morning. Upon completion of the computations, the commanding officer of the ship determined that a total of 125 Japanese aircraft had passed over Aishima during the night, having arrived in 46 distinct waves. That morning, almost as soon as Taney secured himself from general quarters, the exhausted crew was once again summoned to combat stations as another wave of attacks reached the Anchorage. At 6.53, a four-aircraft flight of Vought F-4U Corsair fighters was seen pursuing a single Japanese plane. However, 
it became apparent that the Navy fighters would not be able to capture the plane in time. While the plane was in the process of entering a suicide dive, every gun on Taney that was capable of firing opened fire. Despite the hail of anti-aircraft bursts and streaks of tracers, which tracked the jet, the dive ended in a flaming crash onto a neighboring merchant ship. The plane was destroyed in the collision. Unfortunately, the SS Brown Victory had run out of luck, and all of the crew members aboard Taney watched in terror as the cargo ship, which had been spared from a strike just a few days earlier, burst into flames. The exhausted Coast Guardsmen aboard Taney secured from their combat positions in what became a two-day break that was only disrupted by the nighttime annoying assaults. The last of 15 distinct raids ended at 9.30 on May 28, and the rest of the raids continued until the next day. As a result of the attacks that occurred in the preceding days, Taney's military career came to an end, and statisticians later determined that during the ship's first 45 days off Okinawa, the crew had been called to battle stations a total of 119 times. This marked the conclusion of the most terrible period they had ever experienced. It was on June 1, 1945 that Cobb's assignment as commanding officer at Aishima came to an end and Taney, the cutter, was granted a period of relative repose. Despite the fact that the ship had returned to the fleet anchorage of Higashi, it did not observe any signs of an end to enemy activity. Japanese raiders continued to strike objectives in and around Okinawa on a daily and nightly basis. Taney remained on Okinawa for the entire summer of 1945, spending some of his time off the coast of Higashi and eventually anchoring in Buckner Bay, which is located off the eastern side of the island. The crew of Taney, who were serving as the crew of the flagship for Cobb, had little to look forward to other than another role in an even bloodier campaign that would most certainly end the war. This campaign was the invasion of Japan somewhere in the fall of that year. According to all accounts, the resistance that had been staged at Okinawa, which had been suicidal in nature, was simply a taste of what could be anticipated in the upcoming war. And the majority of people thought that Taney's luck ought to have run out against Aishima. The preparations for yet another amphibious operation came to a halt on August 15, 1945, when it was announced that the Japanese had surrendered. Cobb's command, Task Group 95.5, was dissolved one week later, and on August 29, he shifted his flag to the U.S. Texas after taking command of Battleship Division 5. This occurred after he had successfully assumed command of the division. The cutter, which had been in service since the very first day of the war, was called upon to carry out a final duty while the Coast Guardsmen, who were a part of Taney's crew, were looking forward to returning to the United States. Taney weighed anchor in Buckner Bay on September 9, 1945, and then proceeded to sail north. Two days later, it arrived off the coast of Wakayama, which is located on the island of Honshu in Japan. At that location, the ship, which was the first Coast Guard cutter to enter Japanese home waters after the end of hostilities, participated in the evacuation of prisoners of war belonging to the Allies. After operating as the headquarters for the Navy port director and enduring a significant storm in the process, the United States Coast Guard ship Taney finally departed from Japan on October 14, 1945, with the intention of arriving in the United States. When the cutter finally sailed beneath the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, approximately 15 days later, very few people who had witnessed the Shining Queen of the Pacific prior to the war would have recognized the exhausted hulk that had returned from Japan. The ship that the Coast Guardsmen who left Taney at the end of the war would always remember as the Lucky Lady. This is because the cutter had frequently steamed into danger over the course of the previous three years and more of the war and it had always returned with all of its crew members, whereas other ships had taken the same risks and had not returned with all of their crew members. Following a significant reorganization to her peacetime lines in 1946, the United States Coast Guard ship Taney went on to perform almost every peacetime job that the Coast Guard was assigned to. This included decades of ocean, weather patrol, as well as innumerable search and rescue and law enforcement missions. Even more, 
She traveled to Vietnam for a period of 10 months in 1969 and 1970, during which time her 5-inch main battery discharged in anger for the first time since 1945. Forty years after the United States entered World War II, the Taney was still sailing the high seas. By that time, the ship had earned the distinction of being the last active United States cruiser to have participated in combat during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. In 1986, on the occasion of the 45th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Taney went through a unique service career before eventually being decommissioned. Taney was given a second chance at life when, after it was decommissioned, the lucky lady was designated as a floating memorial. This was in contrast to the numerous other ships of the same era that were either sold for scrap or sunk as ordnance test targets. In the present day, visitors to Baltimore's Inner Harbor have the opportunity to walk on decks that were originally traversed by Coast Guardsmen who were present on the day of infamy and faced the U-boat, torpedo, and kamikaze attacks. For the past 25 years, Paul B. Cora has been actively involved in the restoration of the USC Chitani, which he oversees as the curator of the Baltimore Maritime Museum. Mr. Cora is not only a passionate student of World War II aviation, but he also holds a master's degree in history from the University of Maryland. Yellow Jackets is one of his works that has been published. During World War II, the 361st Fighter Group in use.